called to worship, which is a leader and people response. In the laughter of children, we hear the voice of the gates of the way and find our way home. In the lap of a parent, God's compassion cradles us in the still waters of love. The shepherd of our lives leads us through the door into life with him forever. We are baptized with living waters which refresh us, restoring us to follow Jesus all our days. The Holy Spirit, keeper of truth, is the light which guides us through every shadowed moment. And now let's rise in body and spirit for the opening song. your house of prayer for all people this morning, reminded of those moments where you have come through for us just in the nick of time, and our hearts are so opened and so relieved, and get to sing of the joy that is our salvation in you. So today we remember you in this place, and we've gathered to return to you the good things that you've given to us this week. So may your presence be felt, may your presence be honored, and may your presence be the motivation for us when we leave this place today to live out our lives. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, and I would love to just welcome you to worship this morning. We know that you have a choice in Los Angeles of where you can worship, and so we're delighted that you're here with us today at Founders MCC. Just in looking around, it looks like everyone has been here once before, and uh, so just welcome to you. And in just a moment, the ushers will be, 
The ushers will be passing the attendance pads, and so we ask that you sign in to let us know that you are able to join us in worship today. And I would also like to extend a warm welcome to our online worshipers. There's a place for you to open the church bulletin and follow along with worship today, as well as check in to let us know that you've been worshiping from wherever you are around the world. And one of the things that's a uh, benefit of being a church our size is that so many things are listed in your church bulletin in addition to the things that we announce from the pulpit. And so I invite you to take your bulletin home with you and have a look at all the events that are going on and choose which ones you would like to participate with. There is um, an adjustment, we would say an improvement to the bulletin. At the top, you'll see an asterisk with a note that says, please rise as you are able. And so there's a little bit more clear communication in the order of worship for when you should stand and when you should sit. So um, in case you ever wonder, there's the information and you don't have to ask anybody or be embarrassed or take the lead or anything like that. It's all right here for you. And so the things that we would like to announce this morning from the pulpit is that after the nine o'clock service and before the 11 o'clock service, the trans... Formation Unity Group, which is our min ministry to transgender people, is hosting a bake sale in the courtyard. All the funds from the yummy treats that you purchase will go toward the Christine Daniels Scholarship Fund, which provides financial assistance to LGD LGBT people who are studying um, academics. And so those scholarships are available for anybody, whether they're a member of this church or not. And then also this week, uh, Wednesday night, is our Laundry of Love event where we provide the quarters, the laundry soap, as well as the compassion and presence to people who are either homeless or living below the poverty line so that they can have a day to wash their clothes and walk around a little bit um, more dignified. Uh, outside of the situations that life has put them in. So if you're able to volunteer and show up, it would be greatly appreciated because the more people we have there, the more impact there is. And then also on Thursday night, Bayanihan, which means community in Tagalog, is having their um, twice a month study and Filipino snacks. So that's at 6.30 here in the Hunter Room, just as across the courtyard. And that study is done in Tagalog and in English. Everyone is welcome. And finally, now that construction is done, minus a few little details in the theater, we have an opportunity to uh, clean up the church. And a lot of what that looks like is not necessarily um, soap and water, but we put a lot of things in storage places to make room for construction. And now we need to go into those storage places and sort through things and put them in their new home. So it'd be very helpful to have bodies and hands and stomachs that would love pizza after they work really hard uh, to join us on August 22nd from 10 a.m. to 3 to get the church organized and set up in a way that it can really thrive with the facility that we have. And uh, finally, now it's time for us to rise in body and spirit and greet one another with the peace of Christ. Please remain standing as you are able for the reading of the scripture. This morning's reading comes from John 10, 7 through 10. I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognizes his voice and comes to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them. And they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them. I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me 
will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Hear what the Spirit says today. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. God bless you. Welcome to Founders MCC on this beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning. And it is another wonderful day God has given us to bear witness one more time to God's faithfulness. My message to you today is that God intends good things for your life. Those good things are found in all of the purposes and promises of God for you. One of the most central features of our faith is the idea of salvation. Jesus, in our gospel reading today, Jesus uses the example of a shepherd and sheep and says to us, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. You see, the crowds at Jesus' time saw him as their savior, but they had a different expectation of what kind of salvation Jesus would bring. They were expecting political deliverance from the Roman Empire and restoration of a Jewish kingdom. To them, the kingdom of God would begin with the end of hundreds of years of exile, and they considered the Roman occupation a, a, an extension of that exile. Now today, when people talk of Jesus as a savior and of the salvation to be found in Christ, uh, they still have many differing expectations of what that means and what that idea is. You know, there are some Christian traditions where salvation is all about the future. Salvation equals eternity in heaven rather than misery in hell for eternity. And the expectation is that salvation will come at death or it may suddenly come when Jesus suddenly returns, catching up all the true Christians and leaving behind the poor unbelievers who are damned to misery and hell forever. And that event of Jesus coming suddenly is sometimes called the rapture. You know, at our general conference in Washington, D.C. in 1976, um, we met in a large, beautiful congregational church downtown. And, right during, uh, and at that time, Reverend Elder Frieda Smith, who was the first woman to be ordained in MCC, and also the first woman elected as an elder of MCC, was by 1976 our vice moderator of the Board of Elders. And it was in the middle of a business meeting, and Frieda, Frieda needed to excuse herself to go to the washroom. While she was in the washroom, the police and fire department came in, said there was a bomb scare, a bomb threat, and we had to immediately evacuate the entire sanctuary. So everybody got up and rushed out of the sanctuary. When Frida came back, there was not a soul in the, in the, in the business meeting. And good fundamentalists, from a good fundamentalist trans, uh, tradition as Frida was from, the Church of the Nazarene, uh, Frida said that her first thought was the rapture. <laughs> now, there are other uh, Christian traditions that consider 
salvation almost exclusively in terms of what happens in this world and in this life. Salvation is about bringing, it's all about bringing peace and justice throughout the world. For me personally, I find the truth to embrace both of these extremes. Salvation is very much about this life and what we do in this life. And my salvation continues in the life to come. The idea of salvation in the Jewish faith of Jesus and his time is best expressed in that beautiful Hebrew word, shalom. Now in today's world, that's a popular greeting in Israel. Sometimes it's just used in place of hello or goodbye. In the uh, translations of the Hebrew scripture into English in our Bible, it's uh, almost always translated, in, in particularly in the older King James Version, it's always translated peace. But it means so much more than just peace as we think of peace. We think of peace as the absence of strife, but shalom is much more than that. Shalom means a life of fullness, of completeness, a life of prosperity and harmony. God wants your life to be filled with joy. God wants you to find a place of meaning and purpose in your life. God wants you to be true to yourself, to you. God created you, God loves you, and God wants you to be a partner in bringing shalom to others in this world. One more thing, and when this life is finished, God will give you eternal life. Now that's shalom. So here is my definition of salvation. Salvation is my growing participation in all of the purposes, the promises, and the blessings of God. It's just that simple. I'll say it one more time. Salvation is my growing participation in all the purposes and the promises and the blessings of God. And over my many years of, of, uh, of this journey in MCC, I've made three important discoveries about salvation. And the first of the three is this, salvation is a journey. The second is that salvation is a lifestyle. And the third is that salvation is eternal. So let's look at each of these three. Salvation is a journey. For some people, salvation is about correct forms or correct formulas. If you pray the right prayer, our prayer, or if you believe the right beliefs, our beliefs, or if you've had a certain kind of spiritual experience, our kind of spiritual experience, or if you worship in the right church, our church, <laughs> or if you interpret the Bible in the right way, our way, you'll be saved. Now, fundamentalists often ask, do you really know that you've been saved? Certainty is very important to them. They, have, they seem to have all the answers and it must all be very clear to them. They are very certain and they are very convinced. Frequently in error, but never in doubt. <laughs> when they ask me, have you been saved? I say, no, I'm still being saved. God's not finished with me yet. Oh. Or, or sometimes they'll ask, have you been born again? And I answer, oh yes, many times. <laughs> In fact, the best time was when I came into MCC. You see that I, I have discovered that salvation is not just an experience. It is a lifelong journey. It never stops. The Apostle Paul wrote to the people at Philippi, he said, work out your own salvation, for it is God who is at work in you. Dr. Scott Peck was a psychiatrist who wrote a hugely popular book back in the late 1970s. Uh, the title of the book was The Road Less Traveled. It was on the New York Times bestseller list consecutively nonstop for 13 years. It was a book that talked totally about love and spiritual growth. Another excellent book of his he wrote a little later was entitled The Different Drum. 
And in that book, he talks about four stages of spiritual growth, and I see this as the journey of salvation. It was for me. And here are his uh, four stages of spiritual growth as I would describe them. The first stage is undeveloped spirituality. And at this stage, people have not formed beliefs or principles to guide their spirituality. It can be very chaotic because they are only guided by their own will. And Dr. Peck says that most young children and perhaps one in five adults is at this stage of spirituality, undeveloped spirituality. The second stage is what I would call conventional spirituality. And this stage of spirituality often begins with the teaching of children by their parents or by their churches. This spirituality is attached to specific forms or beliefs that have been taught and must be followed or believed. And Dr. Peck says that this is the stage of spirituality for most churchgoers and most believers. And it, remember, it's tied to correct forms and correct formulas. So if you don't have the correct form or you don't have the correct formula, it's not church. And you often see that when people come into MCC from different churches, and we don't do this the way they did that in their church, so it's not really a church. And that's, that's always exemplary of people in stage two spirituality. Well, here's the next stage, questioning spirituality. At this stage, people que question the beliefs and engage their doubts. They begin to have doubts about things they've been taught in their conventional spirituality. If people advance in this stage, Dr. Peck says, uh, they often become active truth seekers. You see, doubting and raising questions are important to our spiritual growth. And then the fourth stage, um, is what I would choose to call integrated spirituality. Now here, people embrace the mystery of their spirituality. Dr. Peck calls this mystic spirituality. And you can respect, in this stage, you can respect the beliefs or practices of others different from your own. You find that you do not have to have answers for every question. You can live with the questions, and that's okay. And you can live with these questions because you are secure in your sense of God's presence and God's love, no matter what. It's not conditional on whether you can answer a question or not. God is still God, and God is still with you. I love the way my pastor at Sunshine Cathedral puts it. He, he says it over and over and over again. There's not a spot where God is not. You know, God is always with us and we can live with the questions. Now, when I came into MCC, I was in a place of stage two. I had been in a stage of place two spirituality, and I was moving to stage three, starting to question. You see, when I gave the right to question my church in one area of my spirituality, and that happened to be about its teaching around my sexual orientation, when I gave myself the right to ask that question, I also gave myself the responsibility to start asking other questions. And that started me on a spiritual journey that still continues today, and it's been one of the most rich and wonderful things in my journey along the way, and it's brought me to a place of peace and wholeness and confidence and security in God's love. My journey of salvation began when I first said yes to Jesus Christ at the age of nine. It has led me to times of doubt and uncertainty, and I still find myself saying yes to Jesus again and again and again as I hear those words that Christ spoke to his first disciples, follow me. The reality is that people here today are at different places in their spiritual journey. You may have questions or doubts about your faith. That's a good thing. It's a vital step to your spiritual growth. 
The second truth is that salvation is not only a journey, salvation is a lifestyle. The early Christians called it the way. In his Sermon on, on the Mount, his famous Sermon on the Mount, which you can read in Matthew's Gospel, chapters 5 through 7, Jesus repeatedly says, You have heard it said, but I say unto you. One of those teachings deals with the ancient law of retaliation, for instance. Jesus said, You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist the evildoer. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. In 1982, I visited Israel for the first time. Israel at that time was at war with Lebanon and Syria. And on the morning that our group, our, tour, our MCC tour group, was to visit a Galilee in the north of Israel, uh, we were supposed to go through Nazareth and up to Galilee, and our tour guide told us that we would not be able to go that day because it, we, our tour was delayed because there was a riot in Nazareth, and we needed to take another route. But then the police and the military controlled the riot, and uh, we were able to visit Nazareth and then go on into Galilee that evening. And so that evening we were in a hotel high on a hill overlooking the Sea of Galilee in the western town of Tiberias. And we were joined after dinner, we were sitting in the courtyard and joined by two young Arab men, probably in their early 20s, who struck up a conversation with the several of us in our group and we were listening to them and turns out they were from the town of Nazareth and they begin to tell us what happened with the riot that day. It seems that um, there was a woman in the Jewish quarter of the city whose son, her only son, was in the war with the Israeli military in Lebanon, and he was killed. And she was so distraught and so angry uh, that she took a gun, and there were some young Arab people working in her garden, and she shot and killed them. And then they got angry and retaliated, and they began to riot. And at this point, one of the young men said to us, well, we'll strike back. We'll teach them a lesson. We'll push them right into the sea. And I sat there quietly, and I thought to myself, young man, do you not know that 2,000 years ago there was another young man just like you in your, in your city, in your village, and he said that retaliation never wins. Hatred never works. For thousands of years, no one has been learning the lesson. Retaliation continues today, and the hatred is only deeper. But Jesus came and he said, I will show you a better way. We live in a world that seeks strength and wealth and power through competition, aggression, and retaliation. But our lifestyle, the way of Jesus Christ, finds its strength in love, in forgiveness, in compassion, and in generosity. When we follow Christ, our lifestyle works passionately for justice through nonviolence. It's a great tragedy today that so many people who consider themselves to be Christian so often do not choose the lifestyle lived and taught by Jesus Christ. But folks, there's a great opportunity for us here in this church. We have an opportunity by learning and living this lifestyle in this community that we call Founders MCC. We can be a witness to others around us and a witness to the world at large that Jesus has a better way and we can live that way called the Jesus way. Amen. And finally, salvation is eternal. You know, as long as I live, I will be in the process of being saved. I'll be on that journey and I'll be striving to live that lifestyle. And the day will come when I die and my salvation will continue in another life. 
Let me share with you the story of a woman who touched my life so deeply when I was the pastor of the MCC in Dallas many years ago. Her name was Sini Miller. Sini and her partner Maggie came into MCC shortly after Sini was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And in the face of her diagnosis with a terminal disease, Sini found a deep hunger for God. It seemed like she was at church every time the doors were open. At every worship service, at every prayer meeting, at every Bible study class, Sini was there and right in the middle of things. And when the doors of the church were not open, she was using, usually on the parking lot fixing one of the guy's cars because Sini was a great mechanic. Sini <laughs> was very proud of her identity as a Texas dyke. That was her identity. And Maggie was always there too, singing in the choir. Well, the cancer got worse as the end drew near. And Sini was in the hospital again. It was just before Christmas. And one Saturday afternoon, I, I it was on a Saturday afternoon, I went out to the hospital and I went to Sini's room and she was sitting in a chair and she said, Pastor, sit down with me and take my hands. I want to pray. And Sini began to pray. And she, she said, my hands are everlasting. My heart is everlasting. My eyes are everlasting. My lips are everlasting. And Pentecostal that I am, I could feel the, just the presence of the Spirit fill that room and fill our lives. And I thought, my God, you're going to take her right now. Well, God didn't. And uh, I left the hospital. And the next sun Sunday, the next day in the afternoon, I was called and they said, come to the hospital immediately. Sini is dying. So I rushed to the hospital. I went in the front door of the hospital. It was Christmas time. The nurses were decorating a big tree and they were up on the ladder. And there was Sini in a wheelchair supervising the nurses, putting the, an <laughs> putting the angel on the top of the tree. And I thought they told me she was dying. So I, after she finished with the angel, I wheeled Sini, and it was around the time of sunset, and we were by a window in a hallway in the hospital, and we sat and we talked about the goodness of God and how wonderful God had been in her life through this whole journey. And the next day, Maggie told us, Maggie was in her hospital room all night and sitting beside her. And about 4 o'clock in the morning, Sini woke up. And she said, Maggie, come up here and lay on the bed beside me. And Maggie said she got in the bed and laid beside Sini. And then she said, all of a sudden, Sini sat up, and then she looked up, and she raised her hands up, and she said, Oh, Maggie, it is wonderful. And she fell back down. And absent from this life, Sini Miller was present with Christ. Well, the next Sunday, we celebrated Sini's life and God's goodness and the hope of the risen Christ. And Maggie sang in the choir. And the congregation rejoiced, knowing that Sini was with us in that eternal cloud of witnesses that Hebrews chapter 12 speaks about. Do you know today that God has good things planned for you? God wants to be in a permanent relationship with you. God wants to fill your life with abundance of blessings. You know, together we can find a place of growth on our journey to completeness. We can learn the way of Jesus Christ to bring harmony in our relationships, in our congregation, in our community, and in our world. And ultimately, we can embrace God's promise of eternal life. Now that's salvation. Shalom.
Thank you, uh, Reverend Don, for bringing the Word of God this morning. I'm going to be serious today. I hope you allow me that uh, on occasion. Um, this is a, a difficult time of transition for this great institution, and we're see we're, we have some great needs, and and you know. Um, to be honest with you, some of our, our giving is down. It's summertime. We're in a time of transition. We have so much to do because there's so many people out there who still haven't heard that they can be Christian yes. and different. Yes. So now I'm going to ask you to be generous. If you can, give more than you usually do. Thank you. we who are present this morning come to this table, I would invite those who are worshiping online with us to retrieve your juice and your bread or cracker to join us in communion today. And before we go into the prayer of the day, we just want to take a moment to acknowledge um, the passing of Bill Hooper, who was a longtime member of this church and had his first stroke in 2004, 2005, while he was serving in Los Angeles at the denominational level at our headquarters. And earlier this week, he was traveling to Austin to be with family and had another stroke, went into hospice and passed yesterday. So let's just have um, a moment of silence to acknowledge a new member of the Cloud of Witnesses. Seeing your children in bondage and despair, you brought them to freedom by your compassion and hope. Longing to create a people who would care for one another, you spoke simple truths about integrity and justice. Fill our worship with sighs more precious than all we value. You are our word speaker. You came not to build a grand scheme, but to be our foundation of faith. You came not to choose sides like we do, but to be that peace which brings us together. You came not worrying about what lay ahead for you so we could see your kingdom prepared for us. Fill our worship with your grace, more precious than our deepest fears, word bearer. And when we cling to all which holds us back, you empty your arms 
You empty our arms, putting our past into a rummage sale. When we hesitate to stand with the lost, you nudge us forward with the wind of justice. Fill our worship with your peace more precious than the brokenness we grasp. Word of wisdom. God in community, holy in one, hear the words of our hearts as we pray as Jesus has taught us, saying, reminds us that we are good at rules, both making them and then breaking them. <laughs> Paul reminds us that when we gain Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we receive exactly what we need, grace, forgiveness, and hope. So in a moment of silence, let us confess our sins to God that we might know God's healing love for us. And now let us pray together the community prayer of forgiveness. If we were to name all the gods we have before you, rock of redemption, we would be here a very long time. We elevate politicians into saviors, though they are as broken as we are. We misuse your name so much during the day. We have trouble speaking to you in prayer at night. We are so busy, we do not notice how creation witnesses to your goodness and grace. Can we put the other community prayer back up? There we go. Let's all pray this one together. The wrong paths to foolish lives and repeated mistakes. We know all too well where they are gate of our lives. Stirring up the waters with trouble comes all too easy to us, we confess. And locking the doors of our hearts so we don't have to love others is second nature to us. Forgive us our goodness and mercy. May our hearts overflow with hope for others as you anoint us with healing oil. May we share from our abundance with all who hunger for life. May we follow Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to the places of service and life with you forever. Persistently, patiently, lovingly, God pours out grace and joy into our lives, healing our brokenness, forgiving our sin. Loved, we are sent to love. 
Forgiven, we are freed to forgive. Graced, we can offer our gifts to everyone we meet. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. May the God of gates be with you. And also with you. God calls us to open our hearts to others. For they are filled to overflowing with grace. Every day, let us rejoice in the restorer of our lives. We sing, we sing glad songs to the one who leads us. Chaos trembled as you spoke, not wanting to hear your goodness, breaking it apart, rock and redeemer of all. Creation sang eritorious for you, while earth drummed out the rhythm. Each day testified, God is good. Each night whispered, glory. All that was beautiful and true was created for us. But wanting to know sin and death, we exchanged the best you gave to us for the garbage they offered. Using words and wonder, silence and speech, prophets came to us to call us back into your conventable love. But we continued to yearn for what we could not have. Finally, you sent your son in love, in hope, in peace, that we would accept him and the gift of new life. So with those who walk the way, with those who long to find their way, we offer glad and generous hearts to you as we gather with our sisters and brothers, with neighbors and strangers at the table. We sing of that song, the Santo. Holy are you, God of all creation, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. As we remember his goodness and gentleness, as we celebrate his life in us, we would speak of that mystery we call faith. Setting aside all he valued, Christ became our treasure. Setting aside his own life, Christ rescued us from sin. Setting aside our doubts and fears, we yearn for Christ's return in glory. And so on that night that Jesus was to be taken from us, he gathered his disciples around the table. He took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. And he said to them, this is my body, broken for the forgiveness of sins. Eat of this, and when you do, remember me. And similarly, he took from the table a cup. Some say this is the Elijah cup to be touched by none but the prophet. And so he raised it, he blessed it, and he said, this is the cup of salvation. My blood poured out as a seal to the new covenant. Drink of this often, and in doing so, remember me. Here at your table, redeemer of all creation, pour out our spirit on the gifts of the bread and the cup, and on our sisters and brothers in Christ, your spirit gives us life, so we may go and serve others. Your spirit heals our brokenness, so we may bring healing to all. Your spirit graces us with peace, so we may be peacemakers for our communities. And when we stand around your table, all hurtful words silenced, all pain left behind, with hope and grace, our closest friends, we will join our hearts and voices with our sisters and brothers who will forever sing of your glory. God and community, holy and one, amen. Amen. And so it's our tradition at Founders MCC, like MCCs all around the world, to celebrate an open table. What that means is that if you're physically here or you're physically not here, if you're mentally here, if you're mentally not here, 
If you're emotionally here or emotionally not here, you are welcome at this table. It's our practice to take a wafer, to dip it in non-alcoholic grape juice and place it upon your tongue. If you would like, you can take the wafer, you can dip it, and you can place it on your tongue. One of the servers will offer you a short prayer of blessing. And if there's something about where you are in your spiritual journey that you would like to just take communion between you and your God with none of us being part of that, there'll be a station of consecrated elements over to your right at which you can go at any time. What we would ask is that you follow the lead of the usher um, in order to get you to us and back to your seats safely and responsibly. And we also acknowledge that wherever you are, whether you come forward or you stay in your seat, whether you come alone with a friend, with a family, with a partner or partners, doesn't matter. You are welcome at this table and this is the place of grace and love. So could I have the acolytes and the servers please join me as we finish preparing this feast.
together in God's house, in God's presence, yes. and to go forth with God's promises. Mm -hmm. And so I bless you for the week ahead, and may you day by day discover that the joy of our God is your strength. Shall you, let's rise for the benediction. Now may the peace and the presence of God abide with each and every one of us until we meet again. In the name of God, our Creator, Christ, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Guide. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. By participating with us online, you are an extension of this church's membership ministry. Wherever you are in the world, we are so excited to embrace you, to hear from you, and to pray for you. Please connect with us and interact with us by telephone, email, or social media. Be an angel amongst us by supporting this ministry through our donation link. With your help, we expand and reach a greater number of people with God's love through this ministry. We invite you to write to us so we can be in prayer and praise with you. You are a part of Founders Metropolitan Community Church. Email us directly, info at mccla.org. May God bless you.